Good day to everyone. I'm Ian Panganiban and I'll be presenting about From Field to the Cloud, a Geoperson's Python tool chain. So a little bit about myself. So I'm the head of cloud and infrastructure of AI Energy. So basically we're dealing with unstructured data in the geoscience space. So in my previous work, so in my previous life, as you might say, I am working I've worked with surveying and uh, geomatics engineering, which deals with a lot of field works and, of course, uh, going into the field and working on and gathering data and making it some insight. And I'm also part of the Postgre GPH, so basically we're dealing with open source and advocating and promoting the use of open source software for geospatial applications. So here's my Twitter and uh, GitHub handle. So if you want to contact uh, with me and message me, you're free to do so. So here's the agenda of this uh, presentation. So uh, I start with uh, some introduction and I'll go with the geo data, a, a little bit about special 101, about our workflows and some use cases and the takeaway for it. So just an introduction. So as you can see on the uh, left hand side, so this is basically the location of all the oil wells throughout that was drilled in Australia. And most of these are already dried up. So they were doing some exploration and they're extracting oil, oil or exploring oil or gas. So here's the abstract of this uh, presentation that I have sent to uh, for this conference. So, uh, so basically, I'm uh, the topic of this presentation is that a lot of geospatial applications are now being penetrated or penetrating throughout the different industries. So, from energy and healthcare to disaster reduction. So, Python plays a vital role because a lot of these domain experts are now working and trying to make sense out of their data and building their an analysis such that they need to have a good or a simple language or a simple programming language that will allow them to extract those information. So for this uh, talk or for this presentation, I'll be working or showing you some workflow and as well as some tools that uh, we constantly use for the in the geospatial sense. Or the geospatial space. So this is uh, an example in the, the geospatial application or geospatial um, application in the disaster risk reduction. So this is a 3D hazard map. So this is from uh, the Philippines. So we have um, this. Basically, we assess the different hazards, or they assess the different hazards that will come across in a particular place. So for example, this is a hazard map, so flood hazard map. So as you can see, it, it has a medium hazard um, setup, but it, as you can see, since this is a flat terrain, it has a little or little to none uh, landslide susceptibility. And, but it has a high storm surge because it is near the uh, ocean or near a body of water that will May, uh, induce or introduce some flooding. So another example or another use case is the the domain of energy. So on the left hand side, uh, you can see that there is a, what we call a tidal current model. So there is now a, a shift in the renewable, not just a shift, but an addition to renewable energy, wherein we all know that there's solar, wind, hydro, hydropower, geothermal biomass and so on, but there is now uh, a new or an additional renewable resource is what they call ocean renewable energy, in which I was, I can probably say I was a part of it um, before, uh, wherein we, it's trying to extract um, or gather energy from renewable, from ocean energy or from ocean uh, powered uh, resource or energy resource. So as I've mentioned on the right hand side is the location of the well. So 
another example, another newer use case is that it's in the domain of asset management. So if you're into, let's say, construction or let's say you're managing different assets of your company or organization, most likely you need to put it in a, in a geospatial or geo, you need to geolocate your, uh, your assets. So on the left hand side, is, so this is a common use case wherein you're monitoring your forest or the trees you planted for that organization because there's a lot of um, organizations now wherein they are doing this carbon neutral and corporate social responsibility um, exercise wherein they're planting trees. So on the right hand side is more mostly on the construction projects inside the Philippines. So it's more like distribution uh, projects. So we can have a various ways of how you want to use your geospatial data or location data for the benefit of your projects. So when we talk about geo, um, there's a lot of things about geo. So what I've shown earlier is only part of the geospatial context. There's a lot, actually. There's a lot more geo that happens that we tend to forget that we try to encapsulate all of the industries or, or we just know, okay, geo is just getting from point A to point B. But there's a lot more sectors or components or segments about it. So we have what we call the geospatial, is, uh, that I'll be talking mostly about today. There's also geomechanics, geophysics, geochemistry. You also have geology, petrophysics, geography, and of course, amongst others. So as you can see here, um, there's various geo-related topics, but they all focus on the study of the Earth. And for us to understand or the study of the Earth, you need to have a lot of domain expertise. So on, uh, and expertise and uh, knowledge for it. And when we talk about geospatial, we're just talking about the technology or the study above the surface of the Earth or just near surface of the Earth. So anything um, um, on the surface until above. Everything around this other parts here, are, except for geography, of course, we now deal with the internals or the subsurface domain. So when we talk about geo data, okay, you now we're focusing on the geospatial data in this case, is that we try to model the world into different data layers. So this is in the GIS world wherein you have the different data slices wherein it can come from Let's say you have, let's say, elevation, transportation, addresses, boundaries, water features. Basically, what is what we can see in the real world, we are creating different layers. It's like your pizza. You have your, uh, you have your base, you have your crust, then you have your, uh, your sauce, then you have your cheese, then you have your pepperoni, and if you like pineapple, you can put it up on top as well. So when we talk about geodata, we're talking about these different layers across this uh, across this uh, stack. So before I go into the specifics of geodata, let's talk about uh, data in general. Because geodata, uh, uh, if you're into the data science domain, we all know that you have what we call the three types of data. In this case, you have structured data, unstructured, and semi-structured data. Geo data belongs or has different, or they fill up all of these uh, slices here, or this, um, or this graphs here, because when we talk about unstructured data, we talk about documents, we talk about files, uh, powerpoints, uh, present uh, images, and so on. So geo data. They can come from those sources as well. So if you're familiar with land titles, for example, they are not actually structured. In, in the Philippines, we have what we call the, the our land titles are actually written in the uh, previous years. It was written in Spanish, then you need to translate it. And some old titles are like that. So that's why they come from the unstructured. Because those land titles contain your bounds, of your, let's say, house. 
and the location of your house. And most of the time, once we translate that unstructured data into structured uh, formats now, we now contain into a database. So most of the time now, our, the use of your data is now focused on the structured sense. We are not anymore working with the unstructured and semi-structured. So uh, that's why when we proceed or when we're going to work or show the different applications of geodata, mostly they are now coming from the structured domain or structured component, not anymore in the structure. So it's now easier to work with. So when we talk about geodata or geospatial data, we are talking about two different types of data here. We have what we call the vector data and of course raster data. So when we think about vector data, it's basically uh, more focused on the modeling of discrete features with precise shapes and boundaries. So for example, let's model a building. If the building has, let's say, four corners. So in the vector representation, it is it consists or it consists of four points and you connect them into one polygon or let's say box. But once you now go into a translate or translate it into raster data, so raster data, uh, it's basically focused on modeling continuous phenomena and images of the Earth. So from here, we are now talking about pixels. So instead of just points now, we're now talking about pixels. So in the using the same example, of a building, which consists of, let's say, four points, if you translate it into a raster data or an image, it can now become, let's say, one pixel or multiple, or you can have four pixels to, re to represent your building. So I'll show some examples uh, for the next few slides. So as mentioned, vector data is consists or well, consists of points, lines, and polygons. So in the left-hand side, you have the OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap, it's, it's like your Google Maps, but it's free and you can pull down the data and mostly it's more complete actually versus Google Maps, if I'm going to say. And you can actually extract the nodes, the lines, the polygons of this OpenStreetMap. So when you download, let's say, an OpenStreetMap data, you'll have these different points, lines, and polygons. But there are other structures of vector data as well. It's not just limited to, let's say, mapping. It's also representing or it also cascades into the petrophysics log data. So think of it as your signal processing if you're into the signal, uh, signal processing space. But uh, just an FYI, petrophysics log data belongs to the oil and gas space wherein when they usually drill or do an exploration, they get this different signals. If and some of these patterns here would indicate if there is oil or if there are risks inside that when they're drilling. And from that's for the petrophysics. And now we are into this space of let's say building 3D point clouds or in if you're familiar with, let's say, self-driving cars, they are now attaching LiDAR sensors, or let's say, I think the iPhone or the iPad contains some LiDAR to produce, let's say, those augmented reality. So these 3D point clouds, they are being generated by shooting a lot of lasers, actually lasers, then trying to model and create those uh, points into a space. So most of these are, uh, these are the vector types of data wherein you can distinctly um, identify up to the point level. For raster data, it's now uh, a little bit different because, as mentioned, raster data contains about uh, pixels. So for satellite images, for example, so these are the different examples. We've got satellite images, thin sections, and drone images. So for satellite images, so if you're into, let's say, uh, let's say the military or war type films wherein they have this big map or they're doing some, let's say, some zooming in to a certain place. They all use satellite images. So essentially, 
a satellite will just take a picture. But do note that why it belongs to raster data or geo data, the spatial data, because for every pixel that lies in this image, it contains a position. It contains some value or a part of the location. And these are also similar to drone images. So if you're going to fly a drone, then you're get, going to take a picture. As long as the drone, or you can geo-reference this image to, uh, to a location on the ground, you can also point that. But there's also what we call a type of raster data that doesn't only produce location, but it is also part of the geo-data. Since thin sections, they are coming from the subsurface domain. This is similar to the petrophysics lab data, wherein some of these images contain some minerals that will translate if there is oil or belong to a geological uh, point of view. So that's why when we talk about geodata, we should look at it on the more generic sense, that it should not only focus on the geospatial, but also assess the other aspects of that geospace. So, yeah. And one thing that we need to talk about before I go into the geospatial or when we start working or coding, right, is that the resolution of our data. Because geodata containing or geospatial data, once you have what we call this resolution. So resolution means that it is the measure of object, smallest object that can be resolved by a sensor. So this is true whether it's spatial data or let's say the previous one there or the sensor that we're using for getting those thin sections. So as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, image here, you can see that a one meter resolution actually provides more level of detail against 10 meters, 30 meters, and let's say 250 meters. This just means that for every pixel for this image, it contains one meter of resolution. And for this one pixel here, it contains 250 meters. As you can see, there's not any more distinction between 250 meters worth of, uh, if you're going to, into that resolution. So something to note here is that the type or the resolution determines the type of application that you can build. It's, for example, if you're going to use a 250 meter resolution worth of data, can you use that for, let's say, determining traffic? Right? You cannot, you cannot simply do that because you're not going to, because our roads are actually, let's say, one meter, uh, up to, let's say, five, one meter to five meters worth of resolution. Maybe you need up to letter number one, for example. You need to have letter A, a one meter resolution. So another thing to consider is that we also looking at coordinate systems, is that when we're dealing with geospatial data, is that there's a lot of data out there, and especially on the old data, when you're consolidating different data sets, is that you have this what we call coordinate reference systems is that one point of that data or one one point can have a different representation into the earth because most of the position or location that we currently have they are modeled to a specific reference system so when you're now dealing with consolidating different data sets you must take into account this coordinate reference system because you need to have, when you're going to process data, you need to have this coordinate reference systems to be in the, in the similar space. So now we're going to move on to the workflow and tools. So this is mostly focused on the processing and of course the libraries that we're going to use. So I've done the Geospatial 101 already, which is focused on geodata. So in the traditional sense, when we talk about geospatial processing or geo to geo workflow is that you have, let's say, a GIS system, you apply some level of methodology, and you now consider yourself a geoscientist or a geospatial engineer. But now there's actually a shift because the problem with 
having a desktop GIS uh, system is that, or this GIS system uh, provided here is that you need to be well versed on how to implement your uh, your data, or you need to be a geomatics engineer to know what okay, GIS means. Now we are now moving into the different domain wherein we're now cross pushing into this cross domain workflow wherein. From this cross-domain workflow, uh, for example, if you're a biologist doing some um, bird migratory uh, monitoring, you may now work into, you're, you're not only focused on the GIS, you're also looking at other data sets. So this is now where uh, the, the glue, which is, what we, uh, which is Python, comes into uh, spectrum. And this is also enables the different cloud providers because a lot of cloud for, uh, the this big three cloud providers now actually have support for processing geospatial data so for example if you're into micro in azure you have what we call the azure maps wherein you have some level of geo processing for uh, google cloud platform i think there's the what we call the google earth engine which has the most sophisticated way of processing geospatial data so all of these tools or workflow, um, you can now combine them into a specific, to a, or combine it with a workflow, and you can now call yourself even a geoscientist. But something that uh, we need to consider is that the geo workflow should be guided by the domain expert that you're running into or working with, because as I've mentioned, all of the considerations in using the geodata, using resolution, coordinate reference system, they should be taken into account when you're processing and you're working on this type of data. So we're going to go through this uh, workflow together. Okay, so let's start with getting the data. So when you're getting data, you can have various formats or when uh, various uh, forms of it. You can do field surveying, drones, or using mobile GPS. Or you can also do it um, via gathering online sources. So, for example, you have USGS, Copernicus, Open Aerial Map, Open Topography, Open Street Map, as I mentioned, you can download the nodes, or Sentinel Hub. Majority of these, they provide a repository of raster data, except, let's say, for OpenStreetMap, which provides you the vectors or the nodes on the ground. So when we talk about the data that uh, is being presented here, is that this is a, a vector data, which contains of uh, the road network. So the red ones or the pink ones here highlights the road network. Then you have the list of establishments in the, the yellow, and of course the points of interest, which are uh, in the middle of those establishments or, or this polygon. And you also have the raster data, which is below the vector data, which is basically a Landsat or a satellite image that supports the entire content. So now we're now dealing into the Python domain, wherein we're now working with reading and writing data. So essentially, if you're going to look at it, there's nothing different about special about geo data or geospatial data, as long as you know the workflow or you know the model that you're trying to do or implement. So in this case, we are going to uh, most of the time uh, I'm using what we call geo pandas to pull to read vector data because they, it has already those connectors and those APIs available to pull and read different types of spatial or vector data in this case. So if you're you want to connect directly to OpenStreetMap because if you want to download OpenStreetMap data you need to go into the you can use their API there's the overpass turbo API where you can pull the data given a certain boundary and you pull the data but in python there's already a good library to it which is the osm and x so it's a it's a it's basically a, it abstracts the overpass turbo api to pull the data out of openstreetmap 
And for raster data, this is already a very good convention, which is what we call Rasterio or Raster IO, which re uh, reads and writes your spatial raster data. And most of you have used pillow, uh, scikit image to read to read images, but it if you use those, for example, if you use pillow or scikit image to read uh, a geospatial raster data, you're not you'll not be able to read the coordinate reference systems, the bounding boxes, other things that are more important that makes that raster data geo. So this is just an example of a uh, of when you're going to read uh, using GeoPandas. So basically you have, let's say, this GIS uh, shape file, you read it. You can see if you, you read that file, you're going to have these different boundaries or different columns that uh, presents the attributes of this uh, this shape file or this vector data. And notice you have an additional column which defines the geometry of that data. So this is what this is what this is what makes geo data spe special. So in this case, we have the geometry column available because it defines the boundary. So for raster data, this is also similar if you're going to use Rasterio. So this is a TIFF image. When you pull, when you process it, you read it, you just run open. As you can see here, this is what I'm saying about spatial context. If you're going to use pillow, you can only get the, let's say, width and height, but you're not able to get the band, the bands or the index indexes for it. So for example, because this image, this stiff image, it has three layers. So it's the RGB. You can have more. You can have seven or eight. So for example, for satellite images, Landsat, I think, I believe it's about 10 or 11 bands or 11 layers of image that are stacked together. So essentially, you can think of it as that if you're looking at it in a time scale, you can have, let's say, in a temporal scale and you're stacking them together. So in the geospatial sense or satellite uh, imagery sense or remote sensing sense is that you have this this ba this bands which are stuck together. So for example, if we're going to read this uh, landscape image, we have because I put band one, so you're going to produce let's say a NumPy array. So essentially, that's the Essential geospatial tool chain. Those are the two things that you need to do to, to read geospatial data. Then, for the processing, once you have read geospatial data, all of the libraries of Python is now available for your use. So, from pandas, let's say NumPy, uh, Bokeh, Matplot, pandas, scikit image, network X, you can now use those things in the general sense. So, that's why if you're going to look at it, the geospatial tool chain is only two. You only need to read the, the read and write the data. That's it. Now the context of processing it, it's now up to you. Because you can because you can tie up once you read through geospatial data, you can tie it up with your own API, you can tie it up with your own processing systems and so on. But something that we should take note is we need to pre-process the data because of, as I mentioned earlier, you have the resolution problem and, of course, you have the coordinate reference system. So this is a good meme, actually. Which one is correct here? It's latitude X or latitude Y? The correct answer here is actually latitude Y because latitude, uh, when we talk about when we say, uh, we always say a position, it's always latitude, longitude. But in the Cartesian plane, right, it's always x and y. So it's the reverse. Longitude is the x, it moves x. But pre processing, why it matters is that, as I've mentioned, since you have a lot of coordinate reference systems, you need to have consistency amongst those, uh, those different data sets. So, if you want to have less than meters, you need to work all throughout in meters. If you're working through degrees, minutes, seconds, you need to work through all of it degrees, minutes, seconds. It 
just promotes consistency of all the data. So here's just an example of it. So it's a pre-processing using coordinate transform. As you can see here, we're using 4326. So in the if you're using GeoPandas, so the data frame, once we read through it, you can actually do implement a coordinate transform immediately. So EPSP is the European Petroleum Society and Geosciences, I believe. So you have that. We're in the basically list of all. So as you can see here, there's already a difference in the mid, uh, in the units of the, the location. So from degrees, you are now doing it into a meter. And you can also see in the locate uh, in the geometry column, it's now different. So from one twenty one, it's now becoming like this one three four seven because one layer or one one component is that it belongs to let's say meters. So similarly, from raster, it's also uh, you can also do a similar exercise. If we, you're given, let's say, from meters, you can transform it as well. But it's more of a of a hacky way to do it. It's not a clean API because your the problem with the rasters is that you can also create other formats because you're now you're working with in, in a numpy array instead of a data frame uh, as we've seen earlier because you're now doing this numpy. But it's also quite simple, and there's only what we call the reproject column, as long as you have that, then you provide the transformation parameters of it. Then, yeah, basically you define the transformation parameters, then you have, let's say, the target of the transformation parameter, then you can now couple or build or uh, reproject it. So when we're talking about processing, so, as uh, I said here, processing spatial data is simple when you have identified the application and the type of workflow. So it's very simple. You have raster data and vector data, and they all have vector or raster operation. So in since you're now having what we call an umpire array, you can now work with, let's say, a matrix operations, let's say, plus, minus, divide, and multiply, those matrix of. Then you can also implement masking, image filters, for example, denoising, and so on. So you can also do convert to vector. For vector data, it's quite different because you're dealing with point science polygons. You can only do union, dissolve, intersection. You can also do, let's say, the um, nearest neighbor. So for example, because it's points. You can also implement nearest neighbor and raster operations, but it's mostly on the pixel level. You're just dealing with pixels. But if, if you're into vector operation, so ideally, if you're doing nearest neighbor, ideally, you're going to use, let's say, the vector of because it's more detailed. But sometimes, if you don't have that granularity available, you can also use raster operation. So now we go into the visualization part. We're in, it's, uh, again, it's very simple. Actually, it's uh, very simple to do it. You have visualization. You instantiate the map object. You look through the layers, you style the layers, and you add the layers on the map. So in this case, we have an example. So essentially, we define the map object. We look through the geometries that we have, uh, or we read through earlier in the shape file. Now we're going to see all of these shape of the lines here, which is overlaid on the map. So we can just overlay through them. So I'm using what we call volume. So volume basically it it's a wrapper around the leaflet library. So leaflet is the usual web mapping uh, library that is being used for yeah web applications. So leaflet. Um, so there they have yeah it has what we call volume, which abstracts the creation of it. If you're going to do it by hand, it's going to take you a lot of things to do. So. When you when you look at it, you can have all of these components. If you sum it up, you can have as complex of this uh, processing as available. So you can see here, there's a lot of boxes. Essentially, it's doing the same thing. Actually, if you're going to look at it, you're transforming the layer, you're processing the layer, you're 
gathering the layers and so on. Or just combining these different layers here. Or different boxes or different processes. Geospatial processing is it's very simple. It is I don't consider it even as compute intensive. The hard part about geospatial processing is actually gathering the data and making and ensuring that the data that you have gathered is correct. So now some use cases. So we're going to apply the workflow that we've used or that we have uh, defined earlier into the use case. So we have what we call the site suitability analysis. So the main, so this is a project that I have, uh, I think five years ago, ah, sorry, seven years ago already, we're in, we have this, we want to identify the potential resource for, uh, for an um, ocean renewable energy um, component. So essentially we have different layers here, or different data sets. We implement, we did some pre-processing, we combine them and implement some weights as well. Then from those weights, we implement a suitability map. So if you were to look at it, it's a very simple uh, workflow. The hard part is actually gathering all of this data. Because not all of these data are free, and it will take you to do some field work. It will take you, let's say, six months to get that data just to pull it. So that's why when you're dealing with a geospatial scientist, you should not only look at them as a person who just processes or does the office work, but also who gathers the data. Another example or another use case I have. At, so this is one of uh, one of my previous projects or research projects before we're in we're implementing land use classification so land use classification if it's not uh, known to everyone is that land use classification implements or these are vital in implementing land use planning and management so if you're into the real estate real uh, real estate and also what you call the building architectures and building those hazard maps and so on, land use classification, land use man planning and management are critical. So this is also similar to it, wherein you have Landsat. So essentially, if you're go just going to look at it, you're, you're just reading through the data and you're implementing those, uh, uh, you're implementing those computation. So this is similar to, let's say, Rasterio. Once you implement Rasterio, you implement a NumPy operation or matrix operation into it. And this is also one of the uh, projects that they did. So this is, uh, if you're going to think about it, this is Waze or Google Maps, you have the traffic. It provides you traffic data or traffic situation. So the idea behind that is that you have, let's say, points, or you can see these small dots here, which are, let's say, your vehicles. And they have what we call the travel time. So this vehicle to, to reach point one to point two, for example, it will take them 15 seconds. So we tabulated those in a matter of one hour. Then we created a surface out of it. So if you're going to think about it, this is similar to how Google Maps works. You just need to get the data. So the data to get all of these, uh, the amount of time to get all of these, it may take you one week, two weeks, and three weeks. But the power, now the good thing about, let's say, Google Maps or those Google uh, those situationers, they have historical data and, of course, they constantly get your information while you're using it to go from one place to another. You're sending that data into their servers and it's being processed behind the scenes. So the algorithm is very much similar in this case. So some... that. So those are the three cases that I've just uh, mentioned. So uh, just a key takeaway here, spatial data has a lot of uses across different industries and Python can be used as a tool to leverage this data to build your own applications and solve your problems. So what my goal of this presentation is actually to impart the knowledge of how to process those spatial data. So from here, um, uh, I just want to say thank you, and and the final words here is that 
from Waldo Tobler is that everything, this is the GIS code by the way, so everything is related to everything else, but mere things are more related than this. So that's the end of my presentation. So 